All right. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you once again uh, for joining. And thank you, JF, for uh, chairing our last session, which was now a couple of weeks ago. And we all had March break last week and we're back to work this week. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Martin McKinnon uh, from uh, the Division of Nephrology, or as he refers to him as himself as nephrologist. Um, Martin, I've known since uh, I was a resident and he was a medical student and we were on internal medicine together, clearly uh, the smartest one month I spent during residency. Uh, Martin has since gone on to uh, do uh, big and great things. He uh, finished his internal medicine residency at Dow and then went to University of Ottawa where he did a fellowship in uh, nephrology, obviously, and came back on staff here and has been here for as long as I've been here, at least, uh, if not, maybe even longer. Uh, Martin's a great colleague. Um, as we collaborate uh, greatly, I think, between cardiac surgery and, and nephrology, but increasingly what we're seeing is that uh, nephrology is um, becoming more and more involved with uh, the care of our patients at the heart center as a whole. One of the topics that I thought was really interesting um, is just the role of dialysis, uh, especially in patients with heart failure. Uh, and as, as Martin said in his title, with and without renal insufficiency, um, oftentimes uh, in these sort of cardiorenal patients, uh, you know, your options are limited as far as gaining fluid management, et cetera. And I'll let him speak to that, but uh, I thought this would be a great topic. And Martin, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. So why don't I pass the reins over to you? Perfect. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, I appreciate that. I messed up on my introduction when I texted you, though. So I actually did internal medicine in Ottawa, and then I did nephrology in Ottawa as well, but uh, med school at Dell when, uh, when you were there as well. I remember that. It was, uh, it was some fun times. So I did uh, take the liberty of switching up the title, and I hope you don't mind, because really when we're talking about uh, treatment of heart failure outside of renal insufficiency, and sometimes even with renal insufficiency, what we're really talking about, and I'll make the distinction a little bit later, is ultrafiltration, not so much dialysis. And as I said, um, with and without renal insufficiency, ultrafiltration can be used uh, with both. We often think about dialysis machines and ultrafiltration just in those patients with um, high creatinines or low GFRs, but that's uh, not the case. So uh, my conflicts, basically, I prescribe a lot of furosemide, like uh, a lot of the uh, people involved in the Heart Institute do, but I don't own any shares in any company that make any diuretics, unfortunately. Not that I know of. Here's uh, my one slide on heart failure, because I'm certainly not going to lecture the, uh, the Heart Institute, the Heart uh, Center, as uh, Ansar says, on heart failure. You guys are very familiar, much more familiar with heart failure than I do. I am. So certainly you know that it's a constellation of signs and symptoms and not a pathophysiologic diagnosis by itself. And a really simple uh, definition is the inability of the heart to either fill or eject blood um, enough. It's episodic and it progressively worsens. And I think this is crucially important, right? I think we're sometimes maybe on the medicine side a little bit flippant about patients that are presenting with heart failure, but there's progressive worsening over time as evidenced by this um, sort of cartoonish type uh, diagram here. And the mortality is very high. It's rivaling uh, you know, several uh, very severe cancers. And we forget about the mortality that's associated with this, this uh, diagnosis, this entity. Pathophysiologically, again, you guys would know a lot more about this than I do. There's lots of reasons why hearts fail. Sometimes there's disease progression issues, uh, things that you guys deal with, with are either uh, right or left uh, ventricular dysfunction, valvular dysfunction, sometimes it's a chronicity issue. Um, we see a lot about medication uh, non-adherence. Dr. Simon was just 15 minutes ago talking about medication non-adherence on the CBC. And then dietary indiscretion as well. And sodium and water overload is a, is a major issue. And this is something that I'm much more familiar with in my patient population, particularly the dialysis population many of whom cannot get rid of sodium and water. So sodium and water is a major issue overload. And the estimate is, is that 90% of greater than 1 million heart failure admissions, acute decompensated heart failure admissions in the United States are actually the result of volume overload. They're not necessarily a progression of disease, not even necessarily an issue with medication non-adherence, so although this can play a role obviously, but it's simply more salt and water in than salt and water out. I think it's crucial that we know what we're talking about when we talk about hypervolemia. And I think that this is something that 
gets lost sometimes. And it's, it's a crude example I use on internal medicine with the internal medicine residents. And I'm sure they're all rolling their eyes if any of them are on the, uh, on the uh, call today because I use this uh, very often. I describe hypervolemias as if you took the unfortunate patient, put them in a blender, ground them up and piled up their salt and piled up their water. The hypervolemic patient or the patient who's salt and water overloaded has too much salt and too much water. It doesn't necessarily say anything about the ratio between the salt and water. The ratio can be, can be different and that's reflected by the serum sodium concentration. But the serum sodium concentration itself doesn't tell us anything about necessarily the amount of salt in a patient or the amount of sodium in a patient and the amount of water. Suffice to say though, they always have to exist together. And this brings me to my other point that I sometimes think that we get lost on when we have trouble with people repeatedly presenting with salt and water overload or hypervolemia, we concentrate too much on water and too little on salt. We tell people not to drink. We don't tell people not to eat salt or we don't concentrate enough on this crucial portion of the, uh, of the equation. Your brain tells you when to look for water and when to drink. And we've been evolutionarily programmed and, and um, created over you know, a million years to drink when we're thirsty. Telling people not to drink when they're thirsty is very, very um, uh, difficult. It's not gonna happen. We see it all the time in the dialysis patients. What we really need to do is concentrate on keeping them from being thirsty by reducing dietary salt. So when I look at dialysis patients and, and we're looking at uh, weight gains, salt and water weight gains in between dialysis sessions, we really have to address whether they're drinking because they're thirsty or it's because of it's a habit. If it's a habit, it's a little bit more modifiable. Um, you guys know this from probably the heart function clinic, the modifiable habits. But again, if a person has a high, high salt diet, telling them to not drink water or to limit their water to less than a liter a day is not very helpful. How do we mobilize the salt and water? So this is what we do when people come in and they're, they're congested. We um, go through a process of decongesting, reducing or mobilizing the salt and water, the hypervolemic state. And basically we have pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic approaches. And the pharmacologic approaches, which we're very familiar with, obviously are the diuretics. I just use an example of our uh, favorite or most often used diuretic, which is furosemide or Lasix. But extracorporeal ultrafiltration, or here's using a dialysis machine, is another option for mobilizing salt and water and definitely has some potential benefits, um, which I'll share with you. Now, when you invite a nephrologist, you know you're going to get a Lupa Henley and uh, some uh, talk about the, the kidney. I'm not going to concentrate a lot about this because it's tortured people in medical school, including myself. But just to remind people that we use loop diuretics preferentially because that in the thick ascending limb where they function to inhibit the sodium potassium and chloride co-transporter, that is where the majority of the salt is resorbed. So when I'm prescribing Lasix or I'm trying to give uh, people uh, instructions on the use of diuretics, I talk about these not as fluid pills, which is a bit of a misnomer, um, but I talk about them as a, in a bad terminology, get rid of salt pills. They don't allow the kidneys to hold on to salt or sodium. I think that that, that language is crucial. And then I tell people, hey, as you know, water just goes where the salt is. And everyone seems to sort of understand that. So the majority of the salt, 80 to 90% of the sodium is resorbed in the thick ascending limb. Uh, this is where we interrupt using diuretics such as furosemide and some others which we're less familiar with but have some potential benefits. It's the distal tubule, the distal convoluted tubule where thiazide diuretics work. And this is where we sometimes combine loop diuretics with thiazide diuretics to, to poison the kidney further to not be able to hold on to sodium. Of each of these diuretics, I don't have time to get into them. There's some really interesting um, potential benefits of uh, for instance, uh, torsamide, uh, which is used much more often in Europe, bioavailability differences, half-life differences, onset of action. Um, uh, but we usually use Lasix in, in our uh, institution and, and use in across North America as well. What we don't know, and you'll see variations all across our hospital and all across uh, hospitals in Canada and North America, 
are changes and differences in dose, whether people use boluses or infusion, PO versus IV, diuretic A versus diuretic B. And I can tell you that there's no real answers here. Um, there's often escalation in our therapies from uh, dose to frequency, um, and then the addition of the thiazide, as I mentioned, but again, no right answers, whatever works, works. There is problems with diuretics though. There is an issue with diuretic resistance. We see in certain patients with very severe cardiorenal syndrome that um, diuretics just simply do not seem to work quite as uh, much to mobilize the fluid and have to be used in increasing doses. We believe that there's changing of the pharmacokinetics of the medication itself in heart failure. There's counter-regulatory mechanisms. The distal tubule will upregulate its ability to um, resorb sodium. There's rebound effects. This is one of my favorite, right? We remember Lasix is called Lasix because it lasts six hours. People will often take one dose of Lasix in the morning. Lasix wears off by the afternoon. They eat their most highly salt-laden uh, meal later on at supper time and resorb all of that sodium. And that's been shown repeatedly in these sort of black box, uh, closed box sort of experiments uh, back from the 60s and 70s. There's issues with renal congestion and renal disease as well. Although renal disease is probably less of an issue than you may think. The other issue is neurohormonal activation, activation of the renin angiotensin system and aldosterone system, which may be playing a role too. How do we over, overcome resistance? There's no magic. We use uh, sodium and water restrictions, changing the dose, changing the frequency, adding a second diuretic, using spironolactone. Again, whatever works for the given patient. I will point out that if failure to decongest a patient, whether it's, um, you know, our inability in those patients that present with heart failure to reduce the signs of heart failure, the radiologic parameters, or the natriuretic peptides, this is associated with repeated hospitalizations. And it has also been shown that people that back off on the diuretics because of the creatinine bumps, because they're concerned about nephrotoxicity, and if they fail to, to achieve decongestion, it is associated with higher mortality over time and higher um, repeat hospitalizations. So it's crucial when the patients get in uh, with heart failure that we get them to their so-called dry weight. This is where ultrafiltration may play a role. So ultrafiltration is basically the mechanical uh, modality of salt and water removal. It's a distinction from dialysis because in pure ultrafiltration, we're not using any dialysis. We're not using the principle of diffusion um, to reduce, for instance, serum potassium levels. All we're doing is taking blood from the patient with a, with a double lumen catheter, increasing the pressure on the blood supply, on the blood side of the semi-permeable membrane. Oh, shoot. And pushing, um, pushing blood through. Sir, I thought I was plugged in. I'll just plug this in right quick. I'll, I'll, I'll kick right in. This is good stuff. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all I have to say. Okay, excellent. Thank you, sir. Um, so we push the, the ultrafiltrate and create an ultrafiltrate of salt and water on that side of the uh, semipermeable membrane, and it goes down the drain. We see um, when we treat patients, and, and I see it every week on the hemo unit, um, when patients present with either mild or moderate um, decompensated heart failure, very rapid improvements of respiratory symptoms. Obviously, I don't measure wedge pressure, cardiac output, but increased improvements very, very quickly usually take maybe 750 mils a liter off and it gets people feeling much better and, and less hypoxic very quickly. And in patients, you know, um, that we're doing this with, at least with renal insufficiency, these are the easiest patients to dialyze. They rarely have any significant changes in their systemic hemodynamics. Probably their sympathetic nervous system is through the roof as they're suffocating from their pulmonary water. Um, in patients without renal insufficiency, very little in, in um, uh, renal declines are noted when used uh, when ultrafiltration is used, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit. Potential benefits um, of uh, ultrafiltration versus loop diuretics. The one that I'd like to point out is we're making people pee, we're eliminating a hypotonic urine. So there's relatively more water than sodium. We're not clearing as much sodium, whereas ultrafiltration is removal of isotonic plasma water, almost... Uh, 140 millimoles, uh, millimoles per liter uh, of ultrafiltrate. Uh, of sodium is contained in a liter of ultrafiltrate. Loop diuretics are associated with hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. 
sometimes very profound uh, changes in electrolytes. However, the benefit is logistics. No extracorporeal circuit. Loop diuretics are easy. They're cheap. We can use them in the middle of the night. Ultrafiltration is a much different beast uh, from a logistics point of view, obviously. Now, when I showed you before this dialysis machine, it's not quite fair because it's not really a direct um, comparison because we don't need one of these big fancy dialysis machines for di just doing isolated ultrafiltration. And there's some really interesting uh, new little gadgets for ultrafiltration. And these have been around for probably 15 years. I remember talk about them um, when I was training. This is not much bigger than a typical IV pole. It can be used for um, creation of an ultrafiltrate. And what's particularly exciting on the nephrology side, don't worry about this complicated diagram, but they can be used with a double pump setup with peripheral IV access. So basically one IV in a peripheral vein can be used. Um, so when we initially talked about this 15 years ago, there was a tremendous amount of discussion about setting up ultrafiltration units, sort of like uh, dialysis units, ultrafiltration units for people to come in and be uh, decongested um, from their repeated heart failure admissions and, and basically sent home without being admitted to hospital at all. That was sort of uh, something that was thought to be the future, but it hasn't necessarily really uh, come to pass. And there's probably some reasons for that. So there have been a number of ultrafiltration versus diuretic trials. And for the sake of time, I can't go into a lot of them. They started uh, back again about 20 years ago and um, have progressed through that 20 year time period. Although I have noticed in reviewing the literature recently, there's much less uh, recently than, uh, than perhaps 10, 10, 15 years ago. What do we know from them? Let me just summarize and suggest that like always, when we have a, a, a new uh, mechanism and a new cool idea, the early trials with a small number of patients suggested there was increased weight loss with ultrafiltration as compared to diuretics. The safety parameters looked really good. There was improved biochemical indices, the sort of natriuretic peptides, and reduced short-term rehospitalizations. Everything looked great, especially when rapid uh, CHF was published um, almost 20 years ago. However, like a very common story, as we go on, we study more, we increase more, uh, we uh, involve more patients, we design better trials, sometimes we get a little bit diff different uh, outcomes. And this is one example, probably the, the, the biggest and best studied um, ultrafiltration trial was the Caress HF trial, which is old now, 2012, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. What they did was they compared UF to stepwise diuretics um, in very aggressive stepwise protocolized way of titrating, aggress of, of titrating diuretics to urine output. There was a lot of issues with crossovers. So people in the UF um, arm often got diuretics either before starting the UF or afterwards at, at the discretion of the physician. So problems there. At 96 hours, which is a fairly long time after their admission, a majority of the patients, interestingly, weren't actually um, decongested. And their measurements for decongestion were things like uh, physical exam um, issues, peripheral edema, rails, those sort of things. So surprising number of patients that were not decongested uh, fully by 96 hours. Uh, and the ultrafiltration, for some reason, only went on for less than 24 hours. So it, it didn't persist. So people would often decrease the ultrafiltration or dis discontinue the ultrafiltration in this trial and then just start on diuretics. A lot of clotting. People were not familiar with extracorporeal circuits and it's something that um, is crucially important. You have to be familiar with um, how to properly um, utilize blood flow, blood flow rates, sometimes anticoagulation to avoid clotting. There was a lot of clotting in this trial, which put people off. And there was no difference in 60 day outcome of um, either mortality or rehospitalization more importantly. So again, short term outcomes, which is a problem with all these trials, but it put people off. And this is uh, sort of a diagram that showed exactly what, uh, what they talked about ultrafiltration, this weight gain here on the x-axis, they both, whether it was diuretics or ultrafiltration, lost about 12 to 13 pounds in the ultra ultrafiltration arm, slightly higher creatinine, but not really that significant. 
We have a problem with patient selection. We think that probably patients without um, prior diuretics or with de novo heart failure will respond very well to diuretics and don't need ultrafiltration. But perhaps those with persistently low urinary sodiums post-diuretic challenge, so those whose kidneys are still holding on to sodium, um, despite the fact that you're trying to poison them with Lasix, perhaps they could use ultrafiltration. Then there's a lot of debate on the reduced versus preserved LV function, which um, I won't get into today. We struggle in the dialysis unit with having endpoints. We don't know how to get people to the dry weight or what their dry weight is. And that's a major bane of problem, whether it's with ultrafiltration or diuretic therapy. Physical exam, no offense to the cardiologist, at least for volume status in this sort of situation is almost useless. We use hematocrit monitoring, somewhat useful to make sure that we don't kill people with the machine. Radiologic testing has been used, but is difficult. Um, the, the peptides maybe play some sort of roles, particularly in patients without renal insufficiency. And then there's so-called bioimpedance that, to measure total body water as well. None of which is the holy grail of, of telling us about volemia. Maybe this is where we're gonna go, PA sensors. You guys probably know more about this than I do, but PA sensors to look at uh, subtle changes in, in um, PA artery pressures, which can be acted upon early, either with ultrafiltration or increased diuretic therapy. This has been around for a while. FDA is problematic for some reason. I don't know all the details, but this is obviously the sort of the future of this sort of stuff. I'll give you my two cents um, and then finish up. I think that true diuretic resistance is fairly rare, can usually be overcome. In the hospital, I would suggest it's often overcome by the low sodium diet. And I think that decongestion by diuretics that is associated with progressive creatinine rise is the dialysis stress test. So you can't back off because the creatinine is rising if someone is still congested. If you end up with a creatinine of 800 or 900 after your um, your diuretic attempt, then that is the dialysis stress test right there. What I don't know are the consequences, potential negative consequences of the cowboy diuretic usage, right? So these massive doses and high frequencies, what happens with patients with hypokalemia, hypotension, and severe volume contraction, especially when they go home? And what about the impact of the neurohormonal stimulation, the increase in aldosterone and renin angiotensin system? These probably have impacts in the long term of which we don't. Final thoughts, it's been difficult to definitively prove a significant benefit of UF uh, versus traditional diuretic strategies. And the UF logistics are daunting and diuretics are cheap. But perhaps in the specific case of refractory over volume overload, diuretic resistance and renal insufficiency, a trial of dial dialysis UF is reasonable. It should not necessarily be thought of as permanent because we've seen many patients come off dialysis once their volume status is reset um, and you have that better as uh, Dr. Hassan taught me 20 years ago that improved Starling curve, whatever that is. So I'm going to stop there. I know that was pretty quick, uh, but I think it's important to discuss and have questions. So I'd like to thank you very much for your time this morning. Thanks, Martin. That's fantastic. Appreciate that. Um, just I'll start off with a question. If anybody has any questions, feel free to either put them in the chat box or to uh, even just unmute themselves and, and, and fire away. Um, you know, from our standpoint in the surgical world, especially whether we be sort of preoperative uh, in, in a patient who's kind of an acute heart failure, who's either awaiting surgery or potentially a candidate for surgery, or even postoperatively, you know, after we've kind of operated on somebody and we're trying to balance out that, you know, diuretic versus ultrafiltration need. One of the big challenges I think we find is just, you alluded to this in one of your slides, uh, but just finding that right balance, because we often refer to uh, patients as being volume overloaded, but intravascularly dry, and kind of just understanding when you kind of hit that tipping point, because oftentimes, the minute the creatinine starts to rise, we tend to back off the diuretics, thinking that we've probably overdone it. And then we go back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. Uh, just sort of your thoughts on that and how we can kind of better kind of get mm. a for that intravascular dryness, so to speak. Yeah, so I, let me just back up and say that I, I do not like that terminology, the intravascular dryness. And for no good reason, except for me, um, it, it doesn't make sense in my brain, right? These are all paradigms that we use to try to understand this. And we obviously know that in most of these patients, um, if measured, their intravascular volume is not low. 
right, in, in most hypervolemic patients. But what I think makes more sense is to think about them as having decreased effective circulating volume, right? And again, that's another paradigm that, that, that we've made up. But again, it makes more sense to me. The reason being is because um, we can make anyone's creatinine go up by flooding the intravascular volume or go down, sorry, by flooding the intravascular volume. And we think that that's the right thing to do. But if it's not improving the heart, human, the heart function and, and overall hemodynamics, then I don't think we're going to win there. So I think if person is hypervolemic and we think that changing the sodium and water uh, um, volume is going to make a difference, then I think you have to persist with the diuretics. And the, the idea that if we give them um, some crystalloid and the creatinine goes down, oh, see, they must have been dry, I think is, is misplaced. That being said, it's hard, right? It is hard. If they have a decreased effective circulating volume because they're quote unquote third spacing, then diuresing their extra their intravascular volume is, is gonna in fact make them worse. So it's a super, super tough balance. And, and I don't have any fantastic answers for that one for sure. No, but that's great. Uh, JF had a question uh, about what he what you thought the ideal patient would be for ultrafiltration. Um, you know, and what should we do prior to asking? How do we sort of set that up? Um, so pro what should you do? So, you know, I think that the person in, in refractory heart failure, um, that you've given a reasonable challenge of diuretics, which you guys always do, if, if it's not working, then that person is, is reasonable for ultrafiltration. I think one of, the, one of the reasons why we haven't been more aggressive, number one is this, um, Nephrologists have been bad for this. We're uh, constantly looking for these acute indications of dialysis, which sort of drives me crazy as well, right? We don't need an acute indication for chronic dialysis patients. Why do we need, always need an acute indication for the first time we do dialysis? So sometimes we say, well, we haven't given them enough diuretics. We haven't done this, haven't done that. Um, and the historical basis of that is we thought that dialysis um, or ultrafiltration was gonna be particularly harmful. And I think that that harmfulness part of it has been overplayed. Um, the thought that they're not going to recover the renal function, that we're going to worsen renal function, that doesn't appear to be the case. So I think we could afford to be more uh, aggressive with ultrafiltration in patients that are refractory. And I think that leaving patients salt and water overloaded for too long um, has significant detrimental effects in itself and has been shown at least epidemiologically um, in acutely ill patients uh, that that is the case. So um, with respect to preparation, I, I'm not sure I have... Any great suggestions there? I mean, you guys all, you guys use diuretics. Um, you try to mobilize fluid from the extravascular space sometimes, whether it's with albumin or, or squeezing the legs, things like that, um, which can be helpful. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Peter asked if hypernatremia was a theoretical risk of ultrafiltration. I have one last question after that. Yeah, so it's not, it's a, it's a good question. There's been, it's been shown we can, um, uh, dialyze people. So we can change the sodium concentration in, uh, if we're doing dialysis, which is most often what we would do. We'd often run dialysis, even though I talk about ultra isolated ultrafiltration, we, we often will run dialysate. So we can increase the dialysate concentration to avoid shifting of the, of the sodium too significantly. And we can often dialyze, um, with gradients of 10 to 15 without major changes in, um, cerebral edema and things like that. And then what about CRRT and, uh, you know, versus ultrafiltration? Has ultrafiltration, this is Sharif asking, uh, been replaced by CRRT for the critically ill? So again, we're, we're CRT is just continu a continuous therapy. So we can do continuous ultrafiltration, just like we can do continuous dialysis and ultrafiltration, or we can just do continuous dialysis. It's continuous dialysis or continuous ultrafiltration is called SCUF. Um, slow, continuous ultrafiltration. Most of our patients have renal insufficiency. So most of them are dialyzing at the same time. We're believing that maybe uremic toxemia and things like that need to be dealt with. But we could do continuous ultrafiltration as well. And one of the trials um, actually uh, used a continuous therapy instead of intermittent ultrafiltration for people with heart failure um, with the same sort of quasi beneficial, be beneficial effects. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does actually. Okay. Martin, uh, that's great. And um, oh, one more question from Sue Morris here. So uh, will CRRT be offered to patients in a CCU or post-op CV surgery unit? So that's a kind of an interesting question given that we're just starting. 
Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. The logistics of CRT are daunting with respect to um, training, nursing training, and we've seen this in the ICU. If in the future we get it all up and going, the ICU is, is you know, flying and everyone is comfortable and we think that we can tackle that in the CCU, and then we also have um, role for that in the CCU or, or probably not the post-CV unit, I wouldn't think, but maybe the CCU. Um, I think that's open to discussion for sure. I think there's no doubt. I mean, this is a, this is a population that's growing uh, as far as we're concerned. We're seeing more and more people in whom we kind of manage that tenuous cardiorenal balance, and uh, and I mean obviously you know we're we're you know we have differential kind of thresholds for diuretics amongst physicians between cardiologists and cardiac surgeons, um, but you know I think as we get a little bit further along, this is the kind of thing where I think kind of being to closely tied in with the nephrology service and you know understand you know and hopefully there being just a kind of a greater access and ease for starting people on mechanical filtration uh, will be will be hugely beneficial to some of our increasingly sick patients. Can um, I ask you? Can Can I ask you a question? Sorry, yeah. or, or anyone um, is what have you guys seen with like across uh, in, in your conferences with respect to ultrafiltration? It, it in my mind, it sort of died off. It was very like hot ten years ago, and uh, and I just haven't seen a whole lot publication wise, and so I'm not sure if we use yeah. a lot on pump on bypass. So on bypass, it's certainly something that there are, or it's it's I would say almost virtually every case. So interesting. Yeah, absolutely. On bypass, we use it routinely. I mean, we dialyze patients on bypass, um, you know, who have history of renal insufficiency. Uh, we ultra filtrate them not infrequently, as JF alluded to. Having said that, I think, you know, the longstanding effects of what we do in the OR are kind of, sh you know, they're short lived and they kind of buy us a day or two and then we kind of have to get back to reality. As far as the overall literature is concerned and just kind of the talk in the, you know, the, the scuttlebutt at the conference level, there's not a lot, you know, it's, it's not really kind of a popular topic. Uh, as Sharif just said in, his, in the chat, it's kind of died off. Uh, and I think, um, I think this is something that unfortunately, even though it's kind of died off, I don't think it's because it's not useful anymore. And from my standpoint, this is why I kind of invited you is because we do see this more and more often. And I think our armamentorium has to be more than just high dose Lasix or a Lasix infusion. Uh, you know, it's gotta be, okay, what else can we do? Especially in these right-sided heart failure patients who are coming in extremely volume overloaded uh, and in whom, you know, diuretic isn't making the immediate difference. So that's kind Agreed. of thing where we're at. Yeah. Agreed. Super. Martin, thank you so much. Appreciate the thank time you. and the effort. Next week, I will be doing a talk on uh, robotic cardiac surgery um, as we kind of inch closer potentially to a robot here at the regional, although I don't want to say anything for sure. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for attending. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Bye.